Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Dr. Nina Bailey, and I'm head of nutrition here at Igenis. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, where I'm going to be discussing using magnesium in clinical practice. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to announce the launch of the uh, latest to our product range. Um, this is our triple complex magnesium product. Um, we've combined uh, magnesium citrate, magnesium taurate, and magnesium bisglycinate, all in their fully reacted forms. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about the product uh, a little bit later on. Um, um, firstly, what I'm going to do is just sort of, you know, as a bit of a refresher for people, just go over a few magnesium basics. Um, and, you know, as practitioners, magnesium is one of those um, minerals that we we either are already kind of using for clients or using for clients. Um, so what I want to do is really kind of highlight how we spot the sort of signs that maybe clients may benefit from magnesium or identify those ones that might be uh, a little low in magnesium. Um, and then some of the sort of health areas where we know that magnesium can be beneficial. So without further ado, let's have a little chat about magnesium. Okay, so I mean, we, we kind of all relatively familiar with magnesium and the functions, but as a, as a bit of a recap, um, it's the second most abundant intracellular cation after potassium, and it has a myriad of, of functions, anything from sort of active transport of ions across cell membranes. So here we're thinking about sort of nerve impulses, muscle contraction, and so on. Um, magnesium also plays a role in kind of structural uh, structure and function. So we're talking about things like bone health, you know, it's involved in sort of proteins. Um, it's a cofactor for enzymes, really important for mitochondria health, um, and so on. Magnesium also plays a role in immunological function, so it's necessary for macrophage activation and lymphocyte proliferation. Um, but for, for me, the sort of biggest area really is this kind of, you know, this idea that magnesium plays such an important role as a cofactor for numerous enzymes. You know, and when people sort of throw this, uh, throw the sort of numbers in here, you know, magnesium being required for over 300 biochemical reactions. Um, and it's sort of a major cofactor, hundreds of different enzymes, sort of really sort of gets us thinking about the consequences um, that can arise from having sort of suboptimal magnesium levels. And so I've just kind of compiled a bit of a list here to sort of put it into sort of perspective, um, because, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, cofactors for enzymes, but we don't really kind of consider just you know how significant this really is so i've just listed a few here to sort of give you an idea many of the um sort of cofactor functions that magnesium has uh, surround its role in sort of energy um, and metabolism so uh, just as a kind of a few examples if we look at things like ATP you know obviously the primary source of energy in cells we've got the kinases you know so magnesium is really essential for things like phosphorylation dephosphorylation um, intracellular signaling uh, and so on so so the consequences of low levels of magnesium can affect lots of different sort of areas through lots of different sort of um, sort of deficiency to sort of cofactors. And just to sort of highlight, so I'll pick one enzyme and just sort of um, sort of emphasize the sort of importance of this. So we talk about ATP, everybody ATP, you know, the energy sort of currency that is required for all metabolic reactions. Um, more, uh, more accurate a sort of thinking about ATP is that it, you know, it, we should be really, it should be biologically active, it has to be bound to a magnesium ion. So we can be producing ATP, but unless we've got adequate 
levels of magnesium around and, um, ATP is non functional like uh, sort of glucose uh, utilization. We need it for fat, protein, nucleic acid synthesis, and so on. Um, any magnesium dependent process is going to be affected if you have suboptimal levels of magnesium. So then uh, if we kind of think about sort of like long term um, sort of consequences of deficiency, anything from sort of nerve and muscles, digestive system and function, um, brain function, bone density, and I'm going to cover a little bit of, around these areas in a moment. Um, so another area to think about magnesium is, is this role in sort of uh, this sort of gatekeeper, if you like, in the NMDA receptor. So the NMDA receptor is really important for controlling synaptic plasticity. It's involved in memory function. Um, and glutamate is the main sort of stimulatory sort of, um, um, sort of molecule that is involved in activating the NMDA receptor. So magnesium would normally sit within the receptor and it has to be removed to allow activation. So it plays a really important regulatory role in NMDA's activity. If magnesium levels are low, then, then there is less control in how much calcium and glutamate are actively sort of free to sort of stimulate cells. Too much calcium within our cells uh, has a myriad of sort of consequences. So uh, ultimately, there is a series of events that will damage the mitochondria um, and uh, over time may lead to cause, uh, may cause uh, cell death. So um, really important to make sure that our magnesium levels are, are, are high enough to be able to sort of regulate NMDA activity. So we primary excitatory neurotransmitter, we also sort of inhibitory neurotransmitter. So um, GABA plays a role in sort of glutamate, but it needs the activity of glutamate decarboxylate. So here steps in magnesium again. So also um, B6 is really important here as well. So if levels of magnesium are low, glutamate doesn't convert through to GABA. And then we get this kind of imbalance. So low magnesium status causes an imbalance between GABA glutamate or glutamate and GABA. Um, another of, num a number of other factors also sort of influence this, this sort of delicate balance as well. And we're talking balance between um, glutamate and GABA, if you like, and are known to sort of uh, lead to a, a, a myriad of conditions that are associated with sort of neuronal damage. So we're talking about things like neurodevelopment, uh, neurodevelopmental issues, um, neurocognitive decline, we're talking about depression, um, even things like addiction are all associated with overactivity of NMDA. Uh, receptor. So uh, if we think about sort of levels of stress and we have high activity of cortisol, we know that cortisol leads to a depletion of magnesium. If our magnesium status is low because we're not absorbing or, or we're not just consuming enough, um, then we're going to, this is going to sort of exacerbate low magnesium status. So we're going to get this kind of overactivity of NMDA receptor. And just to give you a kind of uh, indication of uh, conditions that are either known to be associated with low magnesium status or have been shown to respond to magnesium intervention. So sort of my, my list here on the left, anything through from neurodegenerative diseases through to things like um, chronic fatigue syndrome, brain traumas, depression, schizophrenia, and so on. Um, and even down at the bottom, osteoporosis as well. So I'll be talking about bone health for the uh, for, for uh, practitioners who are osteopaths, chiropractors, uh, the benefits of magnesium in just a moment. So um, one thing that I find uh, when I'm talking with clients is that, uh, you know, people who are trying to maybe give up smoking or, you know, stress exacerbates, you know, sort of maybe sort of drinking a little bit too much. And one area um, that magnesium can be really, really beneficial for is you know if people are really kind of are struggling with things like addiction so if they're trying to give up smoking quite often we see that uh, magnesium status can be quite low um, obviously alcohol is going to lead to loss of magnesium as well so if you have clients 
who, you know, that, you know, they want to give up smoking, they want to sort of drink a little bit less, then magnesium can be quite, uh, quite a beneficial supplement to sort of um, advise to these clients. Another area as well that uh, is known to be associated with magnesium loss is migraines. Um, we see a decrease in magnesium during migraine attacks and we we see that there is a loss um, in the urine as well. So individuals, people who uh, tend to suffer from migraines are certainly going to be a benefit. Um, they're going to benefit, sorry, from sort of magnesium supplements. And there have been numerous studies showing the benefits of magnesium supplementation in the um, relief of migraines and also the they can low, it can lower the frequency and intensity of migraines as well. So there's a nice uh, Meta-analysis uh, published fairly recently showing that intravenous magnesium uh, to significantly relieve acute migraines within sort of 15 to 45 minutes, uh, which is pretty impressive. Obviously, as practitioners, you know, we don't have the capacity to do sort of IV treatments, um, but oral, uh, so, so uh, magnesium supplements have also been shown to um, help alleviate the frequency and intensity of migraines as well. So that's certainly something that I recommend to people who I know that sort of have um, sort of severe headaches, migraines. Um, thinking about magnesium and bone health, so for osteopaths, chiropractors as well, magnesium supplementation is advisable. Um, we know that a number of factors, which I'll cover again in a moment, um, such as sort of decreased so on various drugs, various health conditions will predispose somebody to or can predispose somebody to magnesium deficiency and this is going to uh, have various sort of consequences on bone health. So not only do we see uh, an increase in bone loss but we see uh, an increase, uh, sorry, a decrease in bone reabsorption. Um, we see higher levels of oxidative stress and inflammation, which is also going to um, have an effect on sort of bone health as well. So uh, another area magnesium is, is uh, beneficial for is um, activating vitamin D. So if our magnesium status is low, we can't utilize vitamin D. So again, this sort of like the relationship with vitamin D status and bone health is really, really important. It needs to be taken into consideration as well. Um, we know that uh, magnesium intake is associated with bone mineral density. So higher your intake, the stronger your bones are set. If your serum magnesium levels are low, then this can be associated with low bone density as well. So magnesium, we think about you know, we think about bone health as calcium, but actually magnesium is just as important um, as calcium in sort of uh, looking after sort of healthy bone density too. And magnesium supplements, we, we, we know um, not only do they improve bone mineral density in uh, older people, but also younger people too. So it's kind of like you're looking after bone health from sort of early years. Uh, touching on magnesium and insulin sensitivity. So magnesium is required for glucose utilization and for insulin signaling. Um, we know that magnesium depletion is common in insulin resistant individuals and in diabetics. Um, if you are diabetic, you are at a higher risk of not retaining magnesium. Um, part of the reason for this is insulin is required to um, activate magnesium transporters. So um, magnesium is really important in sort of the reabsorption for, of, of magnesium to stop it being lost throughout the urine. So, so we have magnesium absorption and then we have reabsorption via the kidneys and insulin is required at that level there. So um, diabetics tend to have higher loss of magnesium leading to uh, lower magnesium status. Um, magnesium is known to improve the ability of beta cells to compensate for various uh, for variations sorry, in insulin sensitivity in non-diabetics. So, you know, that's the, which can be really beneficial for sort of carby cravings and things like that. So if we're not eating, you know, if we're not eating our carbohydrates in a sort of timely manner and we're getting insulin spikes, then, um, 
increasing our magnesium intake can be really beneficial for sort of uh, being able to sort of compensate for those sort of insulin spikes. And um, finally, magnesium also helps to things like lower blood pressure, lower um, triglycerides, all associated with um, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Magnesium also helps to um, increase glucose uptake via increasing the GLUT4 uh, messenger RNA expression. So this is independent of um, um, insulin itself. So there's lots of benefits for, for people with sort of pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Um, and magnesium supplementation has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity and fasting glucose levels in diabetics and non-diabetics too. So optimizing magnesium status can actually, uh, actually delay the progress of, from impaired glucose regulation uh, through to type 2 di diabetes and can be a uh, really useful sort of add-on in the treatment of diabetes. So um, one of the biggest kind of areas that is uh, known to affect magnesium status is our inability to absorb magnesium. So um, digestive disorders. So we'll just touch on that for a moment. So a lot of clients are gonna have some form of digestive disorder and they're possibly gonna have sort of suboptimal uptake of magnesium. So anything that, um, that is gonna to lead to malabsorption such as damage to the intestines, we've got inflammation in the intestines, uh, leaky gut, irritable bowel, Crohn's, all of these. So um, hypochloridia as well, so low stomach acid. Um, we need the presence of stomach acid to be able to uh, absorb magnesium over use of things like antibiotics, PPIs, um, dysbiosis. Anything that sort of affects gut health is going to um, reduce our capacity to absorb magnesium. So uh, low magnesium status as a sort of consequence of malabsorption is going to predispose individuals to further health conditions. Um, so supplementation is going to be really beneficial um, to get those magnesium levels up. Um, but choosing a supplement that overcomes some of the absorption barriers um, is really sort of key to successful sort of therapeutic intervention. Okay, so what factors do we need to sort of take into account um, when we're sort of thinking about magnesium insufficiency or deficiency? So the kind of obvious ones really are is that, you know, we're not eating as much magnesium as, you, as we used to. So that sort of focusing on sort of food choices, cooking methods, processing as well. So we've got clients who eat an awful lot of processed foods and then, you know, not eating sort of, you know, raw, healthy fruit, veg and whole grains and things like that then they are going to be sort of targets really for having low magnesium status. Um, if we have anything sort of that reduces our absorption, so we might be eating well, but we might not be absorbing it. So as I've touched on things like low vitamin D status, we need um, vitamin D to be able to absorb magnesium. We also then need magnesium to be able to utilize vitamin D. Um, any, anybody sort of with sort of low stomach acid, bowel diseases, um, a sort of capacity to, to absorb magnesium is reduced. Um, then we have loss of magnesium. So we might be absorbing it, well, we might be eating it and absorbing it, but if we're losing it faster than we can retain it. Um, so sort of factors like diarrhea, sweating, use of laxatives, um, um, drugs such as diuretics are all going to sort of increase magnesium loss. Um, and then obviously we have sort of magnesium sort of uh, higher requirements during pregnancy and at times of sort of chronic stress. So that we do know that stress leads to uh, loss of magnesium. So I touched on transcellular report, uh, transporters earlier, talking about diabetes. So TRPM6 and TRPM7, as I said, are primarily found within the kidneys and are involved in sort of absorbing um, magnesium. Uh, and there are various uh, SNPs within the, the genes of these transporters that are known to influence uh, magnesium loss. I mean, obviously, you know, as, as practitioners, we're not going to necessarily know what SNPs our, our clients have, uh, but it's just sort of 
one to sort of have on the paper there. Um, and then a number of different underlying health conditions. So if we have clients with diabetes, hypertension, menopause, and so on, um, these individuals are going to be higher risk of, of having low levels of magnesium. So there's lots of kind of indications and, and areas that we know are associated with, with lower uh, magnesium status. A lot of symptoms. So, you know, we can sort of look out in, in sort of clients, you know, are they eating it? Are they absorbing it? And that kind of thing. But then sort of like looking at some of the sort of symptoms that, that are the red flags really for sort of low magnesium status, anything from sort of anxiety, irritability, obviously low energy, you know, magnesium is involved in so many sort of energy or as a cofactor for so many sort of energy responsible um, enzymes, um, people who aren't sleeping well, uh, headaches, as I said, you know, magnesium tends to be um, sort of depleted around about the time of headaches. Uh, restless leg syndromes is a classic one. Uh, low mood um, and sort of, again, sort of going back to the sort of anxiety, irritability, still looking at things like PMS, any sort of hormonal imbalances. Carb craving is a big indication as well of low magnesium status. Um, and then sort of cardiovascular sort of issues such as um, arrhythmia, fibrillation and so on. So, um, I mean, this kind of really relates to magnesium's role in cardiovascular health. So when we're thinking about, you know, when would we advise supplementation? So there's a bit of a list here, really. Anybody who we know is not eating enough um, sort of magnesium rich foods, um, anybody who we know would have uh, reduced absorption capacity, um, taking drugs that we know are either going to sort of um, inhibit our ability to absorb or go into any sort of magnesium loss. Um, people who do a lot of regular or intensive sports as well um, tend to lose a lot of magnesium. So that's kind of advisable either through sort of diet, you know, telling people to eat a little bit more, but magnesium supplementation can be a, you know, a quick new way of sort of ensuring our magnesium levels are sustained adequately. Um, and then sort of looking out for those individuals who might just naturally have increased requirements. So uh, people during the menopause, as we just get older, pregnancy, stress, anxiety, those kind of things tend to sort of just put a little bit more strain on our requirements. Um, and then obviously anybody with a sort of pre-existing health conditions such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis. So these are kind of areas where magnesium supplementation is sort of really advisable. And then if we move on to have a look at just some of the sort of conditions, and I'm not going to go into these individually, but these are all health conditions, uh, stroke diseases that are known to be associated with low magnesium. Um, and they have all uh, got evidence that magnesium therapy can be or, or may be beneficial. So there's some evidence out there to suggest that, that magnesium supplementation can be beneficial. So just very briefly kind of thinking about magnesium sources, um, obviously sort of widely distributed in things like foods and foods, both plant and animal, generally more um, high amounts found in sort of vegetables and grains, um, lower amount in sort of meat and dairy. Uh, oil is also a really good source of magnesium. Um, if we're looking at sort of processed refined foods, they tend much less magnesium than sort of whole foods. Um, and then looking at sort of tapped and bottled water. So hard water is actually uh, quite a significant uh, contributor to our, um, is found through a diverse amount of different food types. So technically, there's no reason why we shouldn't be sort of taking in plenty of magnesium. Um, thinking about sort of things like uh, sort of uh, leafy greens and veg and stuff like that and um, sort of uh, whole grains, rich sources of magnesium, but they also contain other sort of uh, little anti-nutrients in there that are going to inhibit our ability to oxalic acid, for example, um, will uh, 
significantly impair the uptake of magnesium. So there's kind of ways around this. So, you know, sort of steaming and, and cooking is obviously going to be a really good way to um, um, sort of in, inhibit the sort of the, the capacity of oxalic acid and, and phytate to um, inhibit uptake of magnesium. Um, sprouting seeds, soaking seeds as well. So, um, so there's a way to sort of enhance our magnesium uptake, if you like. Right, okay, so uh, magnesium is found in a variety of fruit and veg. It's found in, in some meat and dairy. It's also found in oily fish. But actually, if we look at the data, we are still not consuming our five a day. We are still not consuming our one portion of oily fish uh, a week. And this is sort of um, reflected in the, the, the data that sort of comes out from the national diet nutrition survey so they usually sort of running you know for four to six four to, four to six years old i believe um but looking back at the latest sort of um data if we look at just at magnesium for example um if we look at the figures here for males aged 11 to 18 um within this sort of age gap or age group sorry um they are consuming 18 percent of the RI. So they're not meeting the, the, the full RI. Um, as we get a little bit older, 19 to 64, getting there really. Um, females uh, between 11 and 18 are the worst, so they're only consuming about 67% of the um, suggested RI. And then looking at those that are um, consuming uh, intake well below the lower reference nutrient intake. That's quite scary. 2% of females between 11 and 18 are, are well below the lower reference nutrient intake, which is a little scary, really. So generally, not many of us are sort of meeting the RI. Interesting here is that if we look at vitamin D, um, and this sort of synergistic relationship that we need um, to be able to absorb magnesium and we need magnesium to be able to have So again, I mean, this is, this is sort of slightly uh, and I'm sure with the, the presence of vitamin D uh, in, in some foods now, that vitamin D has improved, but looking back at data, when you uh, were put together, it was estimated at that D levels. So we start to see how this can sort of interfere with things like bone health, for example. Um, this relationship between magnesium and vitamin D really shouldn't be underestimated. So, um, indications to take alongside magnesium as well. So there, there's various kind of ways that we can sort of suggest um, to help avoid deficiency. So again, you know, looking at sort of how we're, we're eating our magnesium rich foods, you know, so cooking methods, things like that, um, to reduce consumption of things like drinks, creation where so it's not just about sort of making sure that we eat plenty of magnesium rich foods but it's about how we cook what we sort of eat with it um and the other factor to look at what we do stress anxiety sleep you know all of those kind of factors as well as sort of diets a diet and supplement interventions um if we kind of have a little look at uh magnesium sort of status within the body so it's and 30 percent of this um, the majority, sorry, of magnesium is actually found in the bones, small tissues, and tissues. Um, very little is actually uh, found within the serum itself. So about 1% of all magnesium is within the serum. 
30% of the magnesium within our bones is actually exchangeable. And it basically, it functions as, a, as like a reservoir. When serum uh, levels fall, we're not doing or we're losing, then, you know, the, the, the bones are serum and magnesium levels stay balanced. Um, and so the, the very, very tightly balanced as well. Um, and this is all kind of related to sort of like cardio. Then it becomes um, so normal serum to one point one. So it's quite a small window there. Um, and to maintain these levels, so nice healthy magnesium levels, um, we need about three point six milligrams per kilogram, which is about three hundred milligrams for. Eighty-five looking at the sort of data, um, we are not really touching those of magnesium a day. So, just moving on a little bit, what's quite interesting actually is that magnesium is very, very tightly regulated, as I, I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, and actually excess magnesium can't be stored. So ingested magnesium is really only retained for current needs. So if your magnesium status is adequate, then your, your, your body will, will only kind of store um, what it can sort of cope with in terms of sort of reservoirs. So um, when kind of consuming magnesium, either through food or through supplementation, the, um, the person's magnesium status is gonna influence how much you retain and how much you lose. Um, okay, yeah, so I mentioned very briefly earlier, so um, serum uh, content of magnesium is generally very little, so it's less than about 1%, so this figure is actually like 0.3%. Um, the majority, as you can see, is found in the bones, some in the muscles, some of the soft tissues, and a little bit in our red blood cells as well. Um, so serum is obviously extracellular, everything else is intracellular. And if we are considering magnesium testing, um, as I said, serum and magnesium are very, very tightly regulated. So you can go off and have your serum levels checked and your serum levels can come back as um, sort of adequate within range. But actually, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that our intracellular magnesium status is okay. So rather than relying on serum levels, it's probably better and more advisable to actually measure intracellular concentrations um, and so look at red blood cell concentration than serum. Uh, it's about sort of five hours um, to absorb magnesium from the diet, at about six hours. Um, factors that influence magnesium uptake are things like transit time through, through the gut. So if you've got a fast transit time, you're not going to absorb as much as you would if you had a slower transit time. Um, damaged mucosal tissue, so obviously your um, science need to be sort of nice, healthy. Uh, not damaged. Um, so um, sort of anything that's going to influence sort of gut function and gut health is going to increase the risk of impaired magnesium absorption. Other factors, physical factors, include things like the pH of your diet, the amount of magnesium that is actually consumed, um, you know, how big your meal is. Uh, um, the sort of absorbing magnesium the best way that the body um, copes with absorption is almost to sort of like have a slow trickle through so almost sort of like bathing your um, your gut lining with magnesium throughout the day and if we think about you know uh, nutrients from food so we don't eat everything all in one go you know, we, we eat everything in, in very small, but, you know, we have breakfast, we have lunch, we have supper, and so on. So our magnesium intake from diet is this kind of slow process. And this is very similar to how it should be with supplementation. And I'm, I'm 
go into a little bit more detail about um, sort of dosing and and the amount of magnesium you should actually have within a supplement to optimize the um, the actual absorption and retention in in a minute. Um, most of it is actually absorbed in the small intestine, um, and it's not necessarily just about how much magnesium is in the diet, but it's your ma uh, current magnesium status that is going to influence how much magnesium you take up. Under normal circumstances, for example, if there are no underlying causes that would stop absorption, unless you are deficient, most magnesium will actually pass through unabsorbed. So there are an awful lot of healthy people out there who are kind of meeting their magnesium um, intake uh, levels, you know, quite healthy, um, who are taking magnesium supplements, but it's not going to actually do them any good um, unless their magnesium status is low. So unless you, you feel like that there is an issue, actually magnesium supplementation may not be beneficial. So magnesium supplementation considerations. So what do we need to think about when we are considering taking supplements or considering uh, recommending supplements? Um, and this is really the, the list of um, factors that influence how effective a supplement is going to be in terms of not only um, absorption um, but also retention and also the sort of synergistic benefits that you get from the magnesium car uh, carrier. So I'm just going to kind of go through these uh, one by one and hopefully by the end of this webinar you'll, you'll have a, a really kind of clear understanding of how to choose a good quality effective magnesium supplement. Um, so the first thing to sort of consider is that uh, magnesium by nature is uh, a very highly reactive, unstable um, magnesium ion uh, and it forms compounds with other substances. So you never get a 100% pure magnesium supplement. It just doesn't exist because magnesium is just too unstable for that. So you will always have magnesium sort of uh, bound to some sort of carrier, some synergistic carrier. Um, and then we can sort of uh, break our magnesiums down. So we're kind of aware of magnesium salts or we could magnesium complexes, um, magnesium chelates, for example. We can be soluble, we have organic, we have inorganic. Um, and when it comes to um, looking at the benefits or the uptake of, of some things like organic versus um, inorganic, um, evidence suggests that organic forms, carbon containing, are by nature more bioavailable than inorganic. Um, and then we have to look at solubility. So if we're looking at um, magnesium salts, for example, so something like magnesium um, oxide or magnesium citrate, um, for magnesium to actually be absorbed as a free iron through an iron channel, first of all, it has to be liberated from its carrier. Okay, so we, we, we take in our magnesium supplements, um, passes down into the stomach, and then it has to be released. Um, and for salts, this is a pH dependent. So uh, if you have a insoluble magnesium, such as magnesium oxide, um, you need the presence of stomach acid to be able to break that bond. Magnesium um, citrate, which is a soluble, is not a pH dependent magnesium salt. So we don't need the presence of stomach acid or it's not quite as vital. So the worst thing that you can actually do uh, um, with a patient who, or a client, sorry, who's got hypochloria, so anybody who's got like stomach acid issue, um, you should really avoid inorganic insoluble salts. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in just a moment. Is is possibly one of the most common forms of magnesium. Um, the reason that magnesium oxide is so sort of commonly used in magnesium supplements is that if we look at the magnesium content, so the the elemental fraction of our magnesium. Um, it delivers a real kind of high whack of magnesium. So it's about 60% of magnesium oxide is made up of magnesium. 
Um, so the remaining sort of 40% would be oxide, um, which doesn't really kind of offer too much of a, a sort of health benefit really. Mm -hmm. However, um, magnesium oxide requires pH, so making it insoluble, um, and it has very low bioavailability. So whilst magnesium oxide can appear to be like really good value for money in terms of delivering a really nice high elemental dose of magnesium, actually the bioavailability is really only going to be about 4%. So when it comes to sort of thinking about how much you take and how much you absorb, they're not really kind of um, on par with each other really. So um, it's better to actually go for a magnesium supplement with a slightly lower elemental fraction, but that has higher bioavailability. Um, and in fact, when it comes to absorption, the body uh, appears to absorb uh, smaller amounts of magnesium more effectively than it does larger amounts of magnesium. So actually, if you, if you have a magnesium supplement that's got a low elemental fraction, um, it might seem like a low dose, but actually the, the body's capacity to absorb the magnesium from that um, complex or salt is going to be more effective. Okay, so our magnesium ions liberated in the acidic environment of our stomach, so something like magnesium citrate, magnesium um, salts. Um, to be absorbed, our magnesium ions have to be transferred through the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so they move along the, the, the GI tract and then they are liberated from their um, salt and they are absorbed through two different pathways. So we have a paracellular transport. Um, pathway, which essentially just means that the magnesium passes in between the cells um, of the gut lining, and then we have transcellular transport. So these are, this is a relatively minor route of uptake. Um, generally occurs when magnesium levels are low. So if we've got a, if we've got a magnesium supplement with a low elemental fraction, we're going to get um, some um, transport through paracellular but we'll also get some through transcellular as well. Um, transcellular transport is, uh, so we're talking about sort of transporters as, a, as I was talking about earlier. These transporters are also found in abundance um, sort of within the kidney and they're more, uh, they play a really kind of vital role in reabsorbing um, um, magnesium as well as uh, absorbing it from the gut. Right, okay, so paracellular transport of magnesium ions is a, is a, um, a major uptake pathway for magnesium ions. However, um, this is a pH dependent process. So our unstable ions, so they've been liberated from their salt, they're moving along the GI tract. However, because they are unstable, they will start binding with anything that they can find um, to sort of latch onto. So this is kind of where we're talking about sort of like our phytates and oxalates within the diet. So um, this is why sort of some of our leafy greens and fibers and um, sort of whole grains can be sort of uh, non-beneficial when it comes to sort of um, absorbing magnesium. This is the sort of binding um, because they shift uh, soluble magnesium back to insoluble. So once magnesium is then bound onto something, it cannot be absorbed. So it has to be a free ion to be able to pass through an ion channel. The other barrier to absorption is the fact that um, it starts to attract water. So we get a hydrogen shell forming around our free magnesium ions and our free magnesium ions then become far too big to be able to fit through the ion channel. However, the tight junction proteins, so these are the proteins that are sort of sitting within the sort of paracellular pathway uptake areas. They can remove water, gel, um, but they do need to uh, have a very specific pH. So this kind of whole sort of pH thing seems to sort of factor up over and over again. So we need a, sp a particular pH to be able to liberate our iron, and then we need a particular pH to be able to sort of um, ditch this water shell and allow the iron to pass through the iron channel. Um, and uh, the other factor to sort of take into account here is that magnesium transport uh, is more effective in areas of the gut that are slightly more leaky. 
So what we mean by this is that if we consider power solely the transport as um, magnesium being taken up between the gaps between our cells, if that gap is slightly larger, then uh, magnesium can pass through it more effectively. So we're not talking about sort of leaky, as in leaky gut, but there are some areas within the, the, um, the GI tract that the gaps are slightly bigger, such as the ileum and distal parts of the duodenum. So there are various uh, areas of the gut that are more effective in taking up magnesium than other areas. So our magnesium salt delivered magnesiums are pH dependent, um, but they do provide a good dose, if you like, of magnesium as long as you can keep the pH um, at, a, at a nice kind of acidic uh, or keep the, keep the um, environment acidic. Um, so whilst magnesium from magnesium salts can be beneficial, um, you're still kind of thinking about sort of you know, we've only kind of got one or two uh, pathways to absorption. If we start to combine our salts with some other forms of magnesium, such as magnesium complexes, uh, magnesium chelates, um, then we are up a few more doors. So we're increasing the routes of passage. So rather than just sort of lumping all, um, lumping one source of magnesium into your magnesium supplement, actually combining two or three different types of magnesium can have significant benefits. So we, this is the reason um, during our R&D, that we decided to have a combination of, of triple max. So in addition to magnesium citrate, we also offer magnesium bisglycinate and we offer magnesium taurinate. So um, unlike magnesium salts, uh, magnesium complexes, magnesium chelates, do not require a particular pH um, to be able to liberate the magnesium ion because the magnesium and the amino acids. So essentially, it is absorbed um, when the uh, acids are absorbed through protein pathways. So uh, magnesium glycinate, bisglycinate um, is absorbed through a dipeptide channel, whereas our magnesium taurinate um, is, is absorbed through uh, an amino acid transporter pathway. So even these two different types of magnesium chelates do not compete for the same route of passage. So now we've got three different um, forms of magnesium and they are all uh, targeting different uptake pathways. Now the other nice thing about including um, bisglycinate and taurinate is that unnatural, so taurine and glycine, natural pH buffers. So I was talking earlier about magnesium citrate is really as long as you can keep the pH nice and acidic. And this is what um, taurine and glycine help to do. So they, by including these within, within the magnesium supplement, helps to keep the pH lower along as, as the, the magnesium passes through the GI tract. And that helps with the paracellular absorption of iron from magnesium citrate. So we've effectively got three different magnesium sources all targeting different magnesium uptake pathways. Okay, and this is really kind of a summary of this that, uh, the, that I've just been talking about. So um, magnesium chelates prevent the formation of magnesium ions. So because magnesium chelates do not give up their magnesium ion, they don't need to, they, they get absorbed through protein pathways, um, we don't, they, they lower the risk of um, the formation of insoluble compounds that you can find with magnesium salts. Um, the nice thing about uh, magnesium chelates as well is that because they are highly absorbable, um, they, they lower the risk of sort of GI disturbances such as, you know, loose stools, things like that. Um, so this is the I've just kind of nice summary really of what we've got here. So our triple magnesium is, has been developed to target four different allopersine pathways. We have magnesium citrate um, through paracellular ion channels and transcellular ion channels. Um, and with the help of the, the sort of um, buffering actions of, 
glycinate and taurate, um, that helps the, the citrates um, environment stay a uh, nice low pH to help that um, uptake mechanism. Um, and then we have magnesium bisglycinate going up through direct peptide channels. We've got magnesium taurate targeting amino acid uh, transporters. So we've got four different pathways, three different magnesiums. Right, okay, so to move on to the next kind of factor. So I'm talking quite early on here about sort of magnesium, or magnesium being uh, a fully reacted form. Now the relevance of this is that, uh, talking as well earlier about magnesium oxide, Man magnesium oxide is used uh, in an awful lot of magnesium supplements. It gives you a high elemental fraction, but it is very poorly absorbed. So magnesium oxide is not an effective magnesium supplement. Right, so when we're looking at our magnesium products and we're looking at our label claims, um, we have to be really, really kind of uh, careful what we're looking for. Because if a product doesn't state that it contains fully reactive magnesium, um, there is a chance that some of your elemental claim will come from magnesium oxide. So as I said, magnesium oxide delivers this very impressive 6% elemental, organic, inorganic, insoluble, very little is absorbed. And yet many, many formulas either use magnesium oxide as a base or they put magnesium oxide in with a different form of magnesium to boost the label claim. And quite often we find that this is not disclosed on the packaging. If you look at a magnesium product, you should be able to um, look at the amount of magnesium, the elemental part, and you should be able to work out the percentage of the um, sort of elemental magnesium. Now, not a lot of magnesium supplements will give you all of this information. Um, they will not tell you what the total volume of the contents of the capsule or the tablet is um, with kind of um, sort of excipients and so on. And um, so very difficult packaging as to whether your product is a fully reactive product. So what have we got on offer? Right, so magnesium products can come in different types and different sort of forms. Um, and there are three main ones. So if we were to take magnesium citrate as an example, a magnesium citrate blend is a blend of magnesium oxide and citrate. So we have magnesium oxide, which we know is not very bioavailable and we have some citrate. So, okay, so this is not fully reacted. For a fully reacted magnesium to exist, we have to have some kind of reaction in which the citrate and magnesium are bound. Um, and that, that way, and only that way, do we have uh, the sort of absence of magnesium oxide. So a fully magnesium citrate is just magnesium and citrate, no oxide. Buffered products um, is slightly different. They combine a fully reactive magnesium with a magnesium oxide, or with some magnesium oxide. Slightly better than a blend, but not as good as fully reactive. And again, um, the combination of the, the, the buffered products tend to be to, to boost the label claim of magnesium. Because magnesium oxide delivers such a amount of magnesium, magnesium magnesium um whether there is a hidden magnesium in your product. So this is why our packaging really, really transparent. You know, exactly what the amount of those sort of products will tell you exactly how much magnesium is like everything out. So there is no hidden oxide in our triple mag. Uh, uh, three triples. We've got three forms of magnesium, uh, two uh, cherry uh, salts, all of these uh, tend to be actually um, influence magnesium. So, you know, from a from an average three hundred 
will only kind of um, be able to absorb about 45% of that. So, so the figures down the side here represent how much magnesium is actually absorbed in which segment of the, uh, of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. So about 135 milligrams of your uh, 300 milligrams of dietary sort of intake is actually absorbed. In different sections, I was talking about the sort of leakiness of paracellular transport pathways earlier, um, different areas of the gut um, have uh, a much higher absorption rate um, but they tend to be really rather short. So places like the sort of judenum, judenum and stuff like that. So um, when con kind of considering how to take our magnesium supplement, um, we believe that split dose is the most effective way of overcoming a lot of the barriers that sort of exist for efficient absorption. So we want to absorb it, we want to contain it as well. Okay, so relative absorption of magnesium is obviously related to the dose. What does that mean? So basically, it means that um, small amounts of magnesium, um, in, uh, I was kind of explaining a little bit earlier about you know, the best way to absorb as much magnesium as you can is to sort of bathe the, 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 the intestines with it over the day. Um, the other sort of, uh, thing to consider as well is gastrointestinal discomfort. Many magnesiums can actually cause uh, sort of diarrhea. And the reason that they do that is that, um, as I said, magnesium ions, because they're unstable, they will form insoluble complexes. Um, they will either form insoluble complexes or they will just stay as insoluble complexes. So if, they, if the magnesium ion isn't released from your magnesium salt, as is the case of things like magnesium oxide, then your magnesium will, will just chumble its way through the, uh, through the gut, not being absorbed because it's not able to release its uh, magnesium ion. Um, now, the, the, obviously, yeah, you're going to end up with sort of like high levels of magnesium sort of um, moving through the gut. The, the poor old little cells that are lying in the gut uh, kind of don't like that very much. And we get this sort of like osmotic flow of water out of the, the cells lining the gut into the inside of the lumen of the gut. Um, in a, in, to try to sort of balance the, the, the concentrations of magnesium between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So it's a sort of classic osmosis, hence why magnesium products will give you basically. And magnesium is actually taped. Right, okay. So you can overcome this um, sort of the, this sort of uh, unfortunate side effect of taking magnesium if you take fully reacted products. So fully reacted, low elemental, is less likely to cause diarrhea than having very high intake of insoluble magnesium. Um, and so again, so moving on to my next slide, so this is some evidence to, to, to show that smaller intakes of magnesium are absorbed more efficiently than large amounts of it. So if we start here, and if I just, just for the sake of this webinar, if we look at uh, 36 milligrams in a study, we showed that out of that 36 milligrams, about 65% was actually absorbed, meaning about 23.4 milligrams of that starting dose of 36, which is quite impressive. That's what that dose increase you get up to about a gram, only about 11% of that absorbed. So, um, so would it actually make more sense if you, uh, you know, to um, better to take that 200 milligrams as so three times a day um, than more at lunch another one would be you would if you were to just take it all in one go 
So split dosing, and this is exactly why we, we, we split dose our triple mag. So we go fully reacted, triple magnesium, split dose. Anything that we can do to increase both our um, absorption and retention, because the other, the other uh, factor to take on board as well is that if we simply just dump loads of magnesium with it in, um, if we dump loads of magnesium into the serum, then you know, the kidneys will just say, oh, this is much happening that my serum levels have to look after my cardiovascular health, and we lose. So it's better to have a sort of triple effect. And this is more this is more likely going to go into retention of magnesium for, 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 the, for the requirements that we need it for. Okay, so as I said, magnesium is unstable iron. So we And we have chosen as our carriers for amino acid. We know that uh, glycine is involved in things like collagen formation, creatine formation, it's involved in glutathione production, it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and so on. Um, also, obviously, has these um, sort of buffering uh, benefits that I was talking about later, which improves power, power cellular transport of magnesium ions. It has no laxative effect. So, um, so we choose glycine. Um, taurine acts as an antioxidant, um, really good for improving insulin sensitivity. So, uh, good for sort of pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome, things like that. Um, very good for cardiovascular benefits um, and also on bone metabolism. And again, we include it because it's a natural buffer, has no laxative effects, and it improves the transport of magnesium ions. Um, and then finally, citrate. So citrate is well established as a really good quality magnesium. Um, it's a magnesium salt. Uh, it had associations with sort of uh, creating loose stools. This tends to be associated with magnesium citrate buffers and blends. So magnesium citrate is actually 100% magnesium citrate and we're looking at the magnesium supplement is causing you problems in terms of sort of like loose, loose stools. It's very likely uh, that it's due to the presence of magnesium oxide. Magnesium citrate also, or the citrate feeds into the citric acid as well. So it's really kind of beneficial in sort of um, energy support too. So these are our three carriers um, in conjunction with our magnesium. So we've got all of these other health benefits, synergistic benefits from our magnesium supplement. So that's kind of it really so i mean our take home messages really are that um, we focus on minimizing barriers to absorption we don't necessarily believe in um, as I said, you know, if just not be able to uh, have the capacity to sort magnesium levels it's actually better to take small doses several times every day, and it may take a long period of time to be able to sort of um, restore um, sort of healthy intracellular magnesium levels um, and get you know get the magnesium into the bones, as it were. So we know that taking high doses of magne uh, magnesium increases magnesium plasma levels, but we do see this increase in magnesium excretion. So it's about improving absorption and improving our retention. So it's about keeping it in the body as well. Um, so this is it. So our, our recommendations are small doses, several times a day over a long period. And um, so to summarize our R&D thoughts here. So we go soluble versus insoluble. We only use soluble magnesium. So this is um, in relation to our magnesium salt, magnesium citrate, so highly soluble is not dependent on pH within the stomach, um, but obviously as it to liberate its magnesium ion, but once it's liberated its magnesium ion, 
um, that magnesium iron is at risk of the barriers that I was talking about, you know, sort of um, phytates and oxalates and sort of, you know, water molecules forming sort of, um, sort of barriers around that. Um, so our soluble magnesium, magnesium citrate, um, the, the presence of buffers helps to keep the pH nice and healthy so that our magnesium citrate can be absorbed. Um, we use a synergistic blend. So magnesium citrate as a salt is really good, um, but actually the, the, the benefits of sort of adding some chelates in there basically provides, uh, you know, this sort of optimized absorption uptake. We target four different unopposing parts. So uh, it's like opening all the windows and opening all the doors um, to allow magnesium in. Um, we're very uh, careful about the, the carriers that we've chosen. So we've got uh, some carriers that will enhance the benefits of our magnesium supplementation. Um, the elemental fraction. So I was talking about, um, you know, the, the, the that it's not necessarily how much magnesium is in your supplement, it's about how much you are absorbing. So we avoid insoluble, we avoid magnesiums with a very high elemental fraction, and our focus really is on, on carriers that have got proven absorption rates. And then finally, so it's about fully active magnesium. Only with fully reactive magnesium can you be confident that you are not getting any hidden magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is not absorbed well. Magnesium oxide is more likely to cause you GI discomfort. Um, and essentially, magnesium oxide is not good value for money for you or your client. And then finally, we kind of take in the sort of fractional absorption by recommending split dosing. So we advocate split dosing to enhance the uptake, and this helps with the retention as well. Um, for, for practitioners who are kind of familiar with our genus and familiar with our, our, our products, you'll find that split dosing is, is something that we quite often advise, um, you know, looking at the sort of R&T behind a lot of the products that we, we formulate. Um, you know, our split dosing not only helps to sort of clean tablets and capsules nice and easy to swallow but it's also really beneficial in making sure that um, you sort of reach peak levels so it's not necessarily about how much you're taking it's about how much you are absorbing and if that means um, having to sort of take small amounts throughout the day to optimize the uptake then then you know that's that's the recommendable kind of science scientifically uh, validated as well so we know that smaller smaller amounts throughout the day are taken up more effectively and here it is here's our triple max complex um so yeah fully reacted triple mac um fully reacted formula multiple health benefits and with all of our products manufactured here in the uk under gmp accredited facilities and um, we have full transparency so as you can see from our label here, you know exactly what you're getting and you can go away, you can do the maths and you can, you can see that these are all fully reactive. Um, so then we, uh, we avoid fillers. We avoid fillers really putting our foot down on fillers and no unnecessary fillers in our, in our new triple Mac. Um, split dosing and we deliver 52% of the IRI. So, um, we have formulated this for efficacy. So we're looking at how to, how to absorb it, how to retain it, the synergistic benefits from multiple carriers and the synergistic benefits from having multiple targets of uptake as well. So, hopefully, um, you'll be having a quick look at our website. Um, for those interested in pricing, Thing. Um, the price for the practice price is 11.04. Any questions or you want any more sort of product advice, then do feel free to get in touch directly. Um, other than that, thanks very much. Thanks very much, everybody, for sort of taking the time out to give up your lunch hours for me today, and hopefully see you again at the next webinar in, in the next couple of months.